Hey, what's going on, guys? I got a very special guest here, Chris Haroon. Chris has sold more than a million of his online Udemy business and self improvement courses in 12 languages in 196 countries. His courses have been profiled in Business Insider, NBC, Forbes, CNN, and Entrepreneur, and many others. Chris is also the author of a number one best selling online course called An Entire MBA in One Course and many other courses. He's an author of the book, 101 Crucial Lessons That They Don't Teach You in Business School, which Business Insider wrote is the most popular book of 2016. Forbes called it one of six books that all entrepreneurs need to read. And he is also the founder and CEO of Heron and Education Ventures, Inc., an award-winning business school professor, MBA graduate from Columbia University, and former Goldman Sachs employee. He has raised and managed over a billion dollars in his career. He's also founded several companies and served on the boards of several Bay Area companies and charities, including the Limo Foundation and providing opportunities for women. He lives in Hillsborough, California with his wife and three sons who all love the Toronto Blue Jays. Chris, how are we doing today? Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me on, on your podcast. I, I appreciate it. It's, it's good to be here. Good to be here. And thank God that baseball is not on strike anymore. Because as, as you mentioned, my my three boys and I, we we love the Toronto Blue Jays. Yeah, we we love that team. Baseball's my my passion. I have a lot of baseball references in my courses, speeches, etc. So yeah, thank you. I love it. And so for you, Chris, mm-hmm. I know you've had a different uh, career path than most. But but where did your career start? Yeah, thanks. So I, I started out uh, working uh, in the consulting industry at Accenture. Uh, in Canada and the United States and the Caribbean. Um, and so uh, what happened when I, was I was a programmer there for about four years and I wanted to work on Wall Street. So I went to business school, uh, eventually worked at, at Goldman, Citadel, big hedge fund, venture capital firms, et cetera, started my own companies. And the problem with me, one of my many problems is I was never, I was never too happy in these companies. My happiest day was always the first day when I got the job. And I thought, am I clinically depressed? What is wrong with me? I work hard to get jobs and I'm not happy. And I remember every bonus season and the cancer of Wall Street is what I'm about to explain. Every bonus season when I worked at Goldman Sachs and other places, nobody was happy because everybody compared themselves with those that make more. And the only time you should look in your neighbor's bowl is to see if she or he has as much as you do, not if you have more. And so I read this book by the Dalai Lama that kind of changed my perception on life and my career. And the book is called The Art of Happiness. And I recommend your viewers uh, and listeners read it. And the Dalai Lama said, the problem with Western society is we sacrifice our health, our entire lives to make money. And at the end of our lives, we sacrifice all of our money in order to maintain our health. And then we look back, we realize we never really lived to begin with. And so my purpose, my passion in life, and it took me until my 40s to realize this, I'm 50 now, I'm old, but my my passion in life is teaching. And so during the evenings when I worked in venture capital, I would teach and I loved it. And it was never about the money. Last thing I'll say in this is that if you chase money, you'll lose your dreams and your money. But if you chase your dreams, as long as you're willing to fail a lot and not care what people think you then something wonderful happens. Your dreams come true and the money follows accidentally. It always does. That's fascinating. And this is one of the major reasons I wanted to have you on here is because we've been, I I go through this right now. I'm 26 years old and I'm always debating. Is it the money? Is it success? Like what is success? Where does it all happen? Where does it all align? And exactly what happened to you, it's really fascinating because we never take time to do that. We go, oh my God, I'm a VP now. I'm the man, I'm doing well. And it's not about any of that, but it's more about what makes us happy. Yes. So what gave you the courage to really take that jump and that leap? And did you expect it would be teaching? And most people think teachers are, they don't get enough money or they're college professor. Exactly. Yeah, I I felt alive when I would teach. And and I guess the the thing that pushed me over the edge to want to quit venture capital, which was fun, 
was I, I taught during the weekends at uh, this, this charity for free, obviously, called the Limo Foundation in East Palo Alto. Now, in the San Francisco Bay Area, East Palo Alto is an area where only 40% of people have high school uh, degrees, and there's a lot of deadbeat fathers. It's very sad. And so what we would do is we would teach these students uh, on Saturdays. And so one day in uh, January of 2016, I created this one day event for them uh, and, I, and I taught them called an entire MBA in one day. And I just did it because I want to help them. And then the next day on a Sunday in January, 2016, I put up a camera at home and I just started recording myself and I called it, I recorded for like eight or nine hours straight. I called it an entire MBA in one course and I put it online to help people. Again, it wasn't about the money. And then I'm very humbled to say that it got a lot of write-ups and stuff. Yeah, but I, but I felt alive. And for me personally, I, I believe that if you give, you'll receive. It's prophetic. It's been true since the beginning of time. And all the companies I worked at over the years, it was very uncomfortable for my managers when I was in my annual review. They would say stuff like, you're doing a great job, yada, yada. However, can you spend a little bit less time helping other people in different departments? And I would always, <laughs> I would always say, no, it's just who I am. Um, and so, and it gave me joy. And I, I find that, you know, if, if I help people, I feel like I've accomplished something and my purpose in life is here. And last thing I'll say is a great quote from Mark Twain. He said, the two most important days in your life are number one, the day you're born, and number two, the day you find out why. What is your purpose? What's your passion? Why are we here? And for me, it's to teach. I, I love doing it. And again, it's not about the money. I just want to help. And if you serve others in your career as well and help them, help your clients change, be more successful, et cetera. If you go in with that mindset of helping people all the time, you'll be incredibly successful. And so one more quick thing. Before you go to any informational meeting uh, with any potential employer or, or potential customer, I want you to research thoroughly what drives them and go to that meeting to help them. Most people are motivated by three things. They want to make more money, they want to get promoted faster, and they want to enjoy what they do. So every battle is won before it's been fought. That's a cliche from Sun Tzu in The Art of War. Mm -hmm. You can do your research before any meeting. Help people, because I promise you, in the long run, call it karma, call it karma synchronicity, whatever you want to call it, give and you'll receive. Because when one teaches, two learn. Yeah, that's, a, that's incredible. And where did you make that jump? to where because obviously in venture capital and on wall street making tons of money did you ever have that life inflation where it's i'm making this much a year and now i gotta maintain and it's hard to get out of this yeah space i i never had that problem because i've always lived below my means always now the problem with with wall street and i had friends that went to jail and they worked at hedge funds like galleon for example where there's a big scandal with Raj Raj Rotman about a decade ago. And I talked to my friend, and by the way, when you go to jail and you're on Wall Street, everybody runs away from you. They don't want to know you. I run toward you because I want to help. And I asked my friends that were affiliated with that, why'd you do it? And of course, there's never any excuse for breaking the law or ignorance of the law. And the reason was because they lived above their means. And so, for example, Galleon, uh, which was a hedge fund in New York City, I had friends there that lived on the Upper West Side. They spent 30 grand a year to send their kids to preschool. It's crazy. And if they, did, if they didn't make a great bonus every year, their standard of living would go down. And so if you live above your means, what happens is it pressures you to kind of do unethical things. So I always recommend living below your means and I've always done so. Yeah. Yeah. I realize that a lot. And just in my age, as people are growing, you see them doing more and more extravagant things to the point where it's like, we can do that, but you need to be in a good place because financial literacy is something I'm really passionate about and it's never taught. And that's what I find interesting about your work is that you're teaching these courses that are never, no one ever speaks about. No one ever talks about it. And in work, you're so focused on, I have to do my job well, not how do I save money and grow this big nest egg so that it gets to the point of, I don't have to work. It's, 
Yeah, it's fascinating because I found that after I graduated, I went to Columbia University for an MBA in finance. And after I graduated, I remember calling my buddies and saying, hey, I'm going to buy an apartment. How does a mortgage work? And their response was, well, they didn't teach us that in school. And so I realized that business education doesn't teach you stuff that will make you successful. For example, they don't teach you how to sell. They don't teach you how to present. They don't teach you how to manage your money. They teach you how to manage other people's money. They don't teach you how to get a job or, or any of these basic skills you need to learn to be successful. And that's why I wrote my, my, my book here, you know, 101 Crucial Lessons They Don't Teach You in Business School, because it was kind of a, a pain point for me that I'm spending all this money going to business school and they teach me stuff that was relevant literally last century <laughs> and bogus theory like supply and demand graphs. And so I'm passionate about teaching people that have no background in business or a lot of background in business, how to start a company, how to manage your own money, et cetera. And last thing I'll say in that is ask anybody with an MBA from any school. So you graduated, do you know how to start a company now? The answer is always no. So in that, just the points you brought up, do you think it was worth it to go through that experience of the MBA? Like, do you think education yeah. is something we definitely need to do? I mean, obviously there's different yeah. forms of education, yeah. but. Yeah. So what I would say is this, if you're considering getting an MBA from a, a well-known school or an expensive school, what I want you to do is this first, and this is going to sound out there. I want you to set up 100 informational meetings and see if you can change careers. And after all 100 meetings, if you can't do it, then consider getting an MBA. Now, if you pretend that each one of those 100 meetings costs you $1,000 or saves you $1,000, well, an MBA costs $100,000 in terms of lost wages, rent, all that tuition, et cetera. So if you do 100 informational meetings and you still can't change careers, then consider going to a traditional business school. Otherwise, I don't think it's worth it. Yeah. And that's not an opinion you hear too often. Yeah. It's getting pushed because everyone believes yeah. that this is it and it's what we're told to do. Yeah. The problem is this also, you know, the, the USC scandal from last year broke my heart because that's just people who got caught. Why is it that extraordinarily wealthy people, you know, have their children attending the best universities? Are their children smarter and better than everybody else? God, no. God, no. You know, people will donate lots of money to universities, which are basically bribes. And this whole elitist system of, you know, legacies, it's just not fair. It's not fair. And so I think that my children, this is the last generation, they're a bit older now. This is the last generation that feels like they have to go to university or consider it. I think in my lifetime, only 50 universities are going to be around. And so a lot of great, yeah, a lot of great companies, they're not, they don't require an, uh, an undergraduate degree anymore. You know, look, companies like IBM, uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, Wells Fargo, and many others. I really do believe that your network is your net worth and that relationships are more important than product knowledge. And it gives me a lot of pride and happiness to know that I can help my students, whether they have absolutely no money and just listen to my webcast, or they take a couple of courses, or they take my MBA program. I love the fact that I can help them get their dream jobs by networking. One more quick thing I want to say about this, because I know some people listening will think that's ridiculous, Chris. Give me examples. Well, a lot of people started in the mailroom at companies. And they eventually became billionaires, starting their own companies, or they became CEOs of companies. They have high school degrees only. And they networked a lot. You know, like in the morning, they'll, they'll come up to you and say, Here, here's your mail. Did you see the Toronto Blue Jays beat the Yankees again like they always do? So I'm a little bit biased there. You know what I'm getting at. But I'll give you examples. Barry Diller, as well as David Geffen. They started in the mail. Okay, they're billionaires. Sidney Weinberg, who's the former CEO of Goldman Sachs for a couple of decades, started in the mailroom. You have Simon Cowell from American Idol, started in the mailroom. The list goes on and on and on. And so what do all these people that start in the mailroom, for example, have in common? They can network. And business, again, is about relationships. It's not about what you know as much. 
And that's why a big rookie mistake when it comes to going to meetings is we jump into business. You can't do that. You got to bond before business. Business is about people first, business second. Network aggressively because, again, your network is your net worth. And I've been, I was doing some research on you prior. And what was the way did you, did you, you find out? Work? Did you find out about my criminal records in seven countries? Are you going to edit that I, out? Oh, okay, I'm just kidding. Uh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> joking, of course. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that uh, you had uh, an ability to meet yeah. some of the most influential people in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really fascinating stories. But what do you think would be the biggest action step for people on the call? Obviously, we could say network, network. Yeah. But it's really different when you're speaking with the CEO versus the first analyst. It, that's a different type of networking. Yeah. And I always love going right to the decision maker because you got nothing to lose. Um, so a couple of ways to do it. Number one, you can leverage LinkedIn. I explain how to do this in my YouTube videos, whatever. But you can leverage LinkedIn and set up informational meetings with people that have something in common with you. And, and let me paint a picture here. Okay. So let's imagine you're 26, you'd mentioned, okay? So let's imagine it's 20 years from now, you're 46, and you're way more successful than you already are today. And somebody reaches out to you and sends you a message over LinkedIn or a written letter, and they say this, John, for example, I know your name is Jordan, just an example. John, John, hope all is well. I also went to the same school as you did, and I'm also from the same hometown as you, and you list those. Please let me know if you have time for a quick coffee. Thanks, Chris. You would accept that meeting because you're helping yourself, a younger version of yourself out. And so we have to look for commonalities and ask people if they have time to mentor us. And most people will take that meeting. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. People want to help you. All you have to do is ask. Now, don't say why you want that meeting. Don't say, I want a job or something, because they might feel bad they can't help you and they won't respond. You keep it short, less is more. And I know for a fact that everybody listening to this podcast has opened every single LinkedIn in mail they've ever received, but they haven't opened every email. And so the way you do it is you do an advanced search in LinkedIn. And you search for, again, people that went to the same school as you, and maybe they're from the same hometown. And you just send them that message. Keep it simple. Subject line is high. Contents of the email is as follows. John, for example. John, hope all is well. I also went to University X or High School X. And I'm also from the same hometown as you, which is X, whatever. Please let me know if you have time for coffee. Thanks a lot. Your future boss. I'm kidding about the last part. So thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, people will do it. They'll help you. Now, in terms of getting meetings with CEOs, what's helped me out a lot in the past is really easy common sense stuff like this. And anybody listening that's a salesperson that wants to reach a CEO, you're going to love this. Go to annual shareholder meetings. Anybody can go. I used to go all the time and I would get one-on-one -on -one time with the CEO and CFO and they wouldn't leave until I would leave. And here's why. And I'm nobody. When you go to an annual shareholder meeting and you can't access all of them, but most you can. When you go to an annual shareholder meeting, Hardly anybody attends. You know, maybe some older investors, you get bad coffee. It's true, the coffee's always bad. <laughs> and then right at the end of the meeting, um, what you do, and by the way, at these meetings, um, a lot of members of the board are there and important people and other employees. And at the end of the meeting, you go up to the CEO and you introduce yourself. Now, the CEO is not going to brush you off because you might be a potential customer, business partner, whatever. And people in the audience are watching. People on the board, investors, other employees, et cetera. So they want to set a good example. So you talk to the CEO and you tell the CEO something along the lines of you'd love to, to work there. You know, you, you're very passionate about the product, service, et cetera, uh, or whatever it is. Uh, say you're, you're interested in helping them to change their business to be more successful by selling your product to them, whatever it is. And the CEO, if they can't help you, you tell them. Is there anybody in your organization I could reach out to to help you save money or to potentially, I'd love to humbly be a part of your organization. I'll work for free. Of course, they won't say you'll work for free, but, but, but if you say that, they might tell you, okay, talk to Joanne Smith uh, in the finance department 
or Jonathan James uh, in, in the, the HR department. And then you follow up and you email those people and you say, I met with your CEO and she or he mentioned, I should reach out to you. Please let me know if you have time for a quick coffee. This works. I've done it. Anybody can do it. Again, you can't access all CEOs in all annual meetings, but you can get access to them if you try. Everybody is approachable. Yeah. And the thing I love about that strategy is the barrier to entry is so small. Yeah. It's not this, oh, you got to spend $50,000 to go to this thing and totally these people. Totally. And what you can also do is you can be a little bit creative with, with, with items you send them. Um, so I got a handwritten note from somebody who's a Toronto Blue Jays fan. And of course I call them back or they'll send me an email. The subject line is, did you see Vladimir Guerrero home run last night? When we beat the Yankees like we always do. And of course I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll respond as, as well. Yeah. Uh, but no, you got to be creative as well and think differently because very successful entrepreneurs and CEOs, they have one thing in common. They're great salespeople. And if you reach out to them in a unique and differentiated way from a sales perspective, they'll respect that and they'll take your, your meeting. I'll give you an example. So years ago, I was at a Tony Robbins event and I met Tony and he invested in one of my companies years ago as well. The guy's larger in life. He's amazing. When I shook his hand, his hand wrapped around mine like eight times. He's a big guy. Yeah, but he's a real deal. But I went to a Tony Robbins conference and one of his customers, one of his clients there uh, was the, uh, the CEO uh, of a company that sells to steel companies in Cleveland. And he mentioned this, this customer of Tony's, this, this client, how he got his first big contract. And here's what he did. He got a really nice box, you know, Pinewood, small box. And he got an old silver dollar from the 1800s, which is worth more than a buck. And he mailed it to the CEO of a, of a steel company in Cleveland. And he wrote a handwritten note as well. He wrote this, dear sir, please find enclosed a silver dollar that has a face value of $1, but in reality, it's worth much more. By the same token, the face value of my services is worth much more than you might think. I would be honored if I can please have a meeting with you to discuss this in more detail. Thank you. So if you're creative like that and think differently, again, you're appealing to salespeople. CEOs and entrepreneurs are salespeople. And if you're creative, you will get a meeting. One last example. When I used to work in venture capital, it was really hard for people to get meetings with me or anybody in BC. It is what it is. You're constantly being bombarded with, with startups. And this one French startup, this is so cool. They made this poster and they mailed it to me. And it was one of those old cowboy posters, wanted dead or alive. It didn't say that dead or alive, but it was a picture of me with a cowboy hat. It's kind of cool. At the top, it said, wanted meeting with Chris. Like I'm nobody, but whatever. Meeting with Chris to discuss our startup. And so, yes, of course I took the meeting. So you, you, gotta, be, you gotta be creative and think differently and people will appreciate it. Yeah, and from the sound of it, they appreciate that effort. Yeah, the little bit and it's a little bit of effort. It's maybe 50 bucks mm -hmm. and a little bit. Where does he live? Where does this happen? How do I put this together? It doesn't take a whole lot. And everyone goes, wow, he, they're, they're innovative. It's good. And also, like, I know people listening are thinking, yeah, Chris, but given COVID, it's hard to get meetings. I've had people reach out to me really creatively and they would say virtual coffee, question mark, dot, dot, dot. And I'd open it and it was a picture of a salesperson with a Starbucks cup with my name, Chris, written on the side of it. And just, do you have time for a quick Zoom meeting? And people think that, oh my God, I can't network now because of COVID, um, you know, so I can't do it. No, it's even better now because nobody is reaching out, setting up virtual, you know, Zoom meetings like that. And Zoom is free to use as long as the meeting is less than 45 minutes and as long as you have fewer than hundred people uh, on the call, it costs you nothing. I love that strategy. That's honestly one of the reasons I started the podcast yeah. is because there's people that you can't get on right. to grab that virtual coffee because their time is what it is. It's more valuable. In which case, if I can market to you, then everyone gets to hear our conversation. Yes. But oh. it's that 10 minutes afterwards where it's, you can have a deeper conversation and whatever it is. 
that's what I found so interesting about podcasts. It's great. And another thing I recommend that your, your listeners do is before any meeting you have with anybody for the rest of your life, go to the Twitter profile of that person and see who they follow. You know, if they follow, you know, Blue Jay players, the Toronto Blue Jays, then that's what you'll talk about in the meeting. If they follow, their, they follow, I don't know, Will Smith, you can talk about his awesome book called Will. If they follow a sport, you can talk about that because sports is always great boardroom talk. And you got to bond for the first 10 minutes of every meeting first, because you'll never get that second chance to make that personal connection with whoever you're, you're meeting with. Yeah, it's getting that emotional rapport. I completely agree. Yeah. So the other thing that I find super interesting about you, Chris, is that you're very on top of trends, on top of where things are going, just probably from the VC days and just your experience. So I, I saw your TED talk where it was technology, education, and acceptance. Right. Yeah. And I'm curious about where that T, how mm -hmm. you feel about that relates to crypto, NFTs, and everything going on there, because it's kind of polarizing. Some people are no, some people are yes. Yeah. Wait, so, how you... Yeah. So I, I think that w whenever I look at an investment opportunity or a sector, I ask myself a basic question, which is this. In five years, will this company or this sector be more relevant or less relevant than it is today? And that kind of allows me to be unemotional about being a long-term investor and not sell stocks because they're going down. <laughs> you know, Warren Buffett said the New York Stock Exchange is the only store in the world where consumers sell stuff when it goes on sale. And so when it comes to cryptocurrencies and NFTs, I think they're gonna be much more relevant in five years than they are today. So when do I buy? The, what, the, the, the time when I buy stocks or any asset class is when there's blood in the streets. And that's an unfortunate thing to say, but you gotta be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. And I wanna give your listeners a, a great data point on when to buy. So there's an index um, called the VIX, V-I-X. And you can go to finance.yahoo.com and type up VIX, V-I-X. It's just an indice. And what it measures is the expected volatility in the S&P 500 stocks over the next month or so. And when volatility is high, stocks crash. So here, here's, the, here's the benchmark to look at. When you see the VIX, go above 70 or 80, no matter what happens, I want you to back up the truck and buy stocks and slightly risk your asset classes as well, because everybody is selling that. This always works. You can backdate it. Now, the VIX was released by the CBOE, CBOE Chicago Board of Exchange, uh, back in 1990. And it's been above 70 or 80 only a couple of times. You know, one, one time was March of 2020, when Elon Musk bought a lot of Tesla. And the other was in 2008, when we were within 24 hours of bank machines not working. And when the VIX is above 70 or 80, I promise you, you're going to feel like the world is ending and the dumbest thing to do is buy stocks. You have to do it because nobody else is doing it. And as Wayne Gretzky said, I'm Canadian, I got to go there. Um, he was successful not because he skated to where the puck is, but rather because he skated to where the puck is going to be. What does that mean for finance and investing? Well, you got to invest in stocks that people are going to like. If you already invest in stocks that everybody else likes, there's not that many incremental investors to push the stock or whatever asset class it is higher. I like to buy when everyone's freaking out. And when the VIX is above 70 or 80, that's when you do it. Last thing I'll say about Elon Musk, because I brought him up with him backing up the truck and buying shares of Tesla in March of 2020 when the VIX was above 80. You have to be unemotional as well. And I've worked for a lot of billionaires over the years. And one thing almost all of them have in common is they're very unemotional. They never get too happy when things go well and they don't freak out when things go poorly. They're unemotional always. And you have to be unemotional in business. Otherwise, you will sell stocks when they go on sale. I, I love that lesson because I've been uh, invested in stocks for probably since I was like 13. And it's always so fascinating through the ups and the downs. You got people who, friends who are traders and they're like, well, you got to get out. The world's ending. And every single year, new all-time high, new all-time high, new all-time high. And it's just, 
it's super fascinating. I love that VIX. I've never heard that before. Yeah, it works. It works. I put my reputation on the line. It works. It's the only indicator I ever mentioned because none of the other ones work. This yeah. is, and all it measures is fear. <laughs> That's it. And when the VIX is low, like below 20 or 30 or so, it's greed. Everyone's buying. If you're a contrarian in business, you'll be very successful. Very successful. Yeah, and not a lot of people realize that, that it just takes yeah. doing the opposite of what everyone else is doing, especially in investing, yes. to be a winner. Yes, totally. And with my career, what I'm doing, when I first quit venture capital to teach, people thought I was crazy. That's a good thing. Because the second people don't think I'm crazy doing what I'm doing, then it's too late. You know, you, you look at a picture of, of Albert Einstein, it, it, my kids were laughing at this, but if you Google Einst, Albert Einstein, you see a picture of this guy with long hair, this old guy with long hair with his tongue sticking out. Remember that, that picture? And you don't think crazy, you think genius. And so initially they think you're crazy. Then you get a little bit of success and you're like, oh, maybe crazy genius. And then a lot of success, you're just genius. So people still think I'm crazy by the way, that's okay. But, but in general, like it's even Steve Jobs, God bless him, but these amazing entrepreneurs, they don't give a damn what people think of them. They never did. And that's why they're successful. You know, Steve Jobs used to show up to work when he worked at Activision and Atari, um, you know, with, with long hair, he didn't shower. And I'm not saying you shouldn't shower, but they made him, <laughs> they made him work the, the night shift. And a lot of successful entrepreneurs, like they just don't give a damn what people think. And if we live our lives at a level where we don't care about what people think of us. I'm not saying be rude or disingenu disingenuous, but you'll be more successful. And so here's my homework. Can I give your, 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 your amazing uh, listeners homework? Absolutely. Okay, great. So, and this is when one teaches to learn, this is therapeutic for me too. Okay, here I go. I want everybody to do the following. I want you to write down this. I don't care about X, okay? And I want you to do that 10 times. And I want you to fill in the blank for X. For example, I don't care what people think of my job. I don't care what people think of the way I brush my hair. I don't care what people think of the car I drive. I don't care what people think of my preferences in life. And I promise you, if you believe that and you write it down enough times, you will reach this insane level of euphoria you never thought you could feel before. Because as Winston Churchill said, I once met a man who on his deathbed talked about all the worries he had in his life, none of which came true. We worry too much and we think, what are people thinking of us when they're not thinking of us at all? So if you take all those 10 things I told you about, you put it in a box and you never worry about that crap again, then the likelihood you'll reach your full potential in life goes up materially. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And there's a movie I want to recommend that everybody watch, please. It's one of my favorite movies. It's called The Three Idiots. <laughs> and it, it's actually, it's a Bollywood movie. It's three hours long. And it basically, I don't want to ruin it for you. I laughed a number of times and cried as well. It'll change your outlook on your career and life. Do what yeah, you I'm want. Done. Yeah. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do what you want to do. And just understand, like Mark Cuban said, you only have to be right in business one time. I love that. Because, I mean, all of us think it's all these compounding this, that, this. And it comes down to, we really got to find out whatever it is for us, whatever we do, whatever makes us happy. And yes. with the whole social media world that we're in, it's constantly keeping up with the Joneses this, keeping up with the Joneses that. Oh, you haven't traveled yet? Like, why are you not and it's just way, way too much. And yeah. we always find it. So I think that's a great reminder for everyone that like, don't care what other people say. You're on okay. your own path. So people get depressed when they use Facebook because people only post shallow stuff about how weather life is going. You know, I, I don't use Facebook anymore. I don't look at that. One thing I want to say for your viewers, if, if any or listeners, if anybody is not sure what you want to do career-wise in life, then what I want you to do is this. I want you to think to yourself, if I'm given 30 days off and I can't travel and I can't go to work and I can't go to school, what am I going to do with my time? And whatever that is, 
that is your passion in your career and you should go after it no matter what anybody thinks. You know, don't become a doctor or lawyer or engineer because your parents want you to. Otherwise, you'll be depressed your whole life. Do what you want to do in life that makes you happiest always. And if anybody is listening and they're in their 50s like I am, I got to say it's never too late to start over and here's why. So since the 1950s, the average life expectancy globally has gone up 26 years. So if you're 50, you're actually 24. I'm two years younger than you, Jordan. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you can start over. You, and the average age of somebody starting a company in America now, for example, is over 50 years old. 50 is young, I, I think. Although I do have senior moments every now and then. Yeah, the older I get, the better I was. But you could always start over. You can always start over leverage online education, and more importantly, network. Find people similar to you and ask for help and guidance. Find your Yodas. They're out there. They want to help you. All you got to do is ask. Ask and you'll receive. It's prophetic and it's been true since the beginning of time. Absolutely. Okay. Profound stuff. And I, I love the stuff with the mentoring and the online education. Let's dive there. And then because I know your time. So with online education, uh, we got the Heron MBA. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think, oh my God, I got to go to Columbia. I got to go to Warren. I got to go to U Chicago. What allows this to be different and what allows it to be real? Because a lot of this stuff's not real. Yeah. Yeah. So every single class I have, and, and you can go to uh, heronmba.com, that's H-A-R-O-U-N MBA.com. Uh, a lot of the stuff I teach, all the stuff I teach, I always ask myself two words. So what? It's a so what test. How is this going to help? You? And so in all my classes, I have tons of arrows in my quiver or tools in my toolbox that I provide you with as frameworks to help you approach different ways to solve business problems, how to start companies, how to invest, et cetera. I give you a ton of frameworks based on my real life practical experience and never based on theory. And there's a reason why we've had a ton of people take my MBA degree program because it's cost effective. Right now it's on sale at $499. It's 50% off. And you can go to uh, H-A-R-O-U-N uh, MBA.com. There's a 30 day 100% money back guarantee. And my return rate is really, really low, right? And so, but I like to help people. I, I do because it's fun as well. I love it. Yeah. And I'll put all those links in the show notes. Sure. Yeah. And it, it's, it's amazing what, what can be done nowadays because there's yeah. really no limitations with the internet. Yeah. Um, would, did you uh, expect it to be Udemy or were, did you try a couple other platforms before you got really yeah. entrenched in Udemy? Yeah. So Udemy is Google and everyone else is Bing when it comes to ed tech. Right. So usually the way it works is one platform tends to get the largest market share in tech. Think Google for search, YouTube for watching videos online. So Udemy is just the largest uh, in the marketplace. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Cause I was curious about that decision and I wasn't sure if there were yeah. other options out there at that time. Yeah. 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 There, there's, there's really nobody else. Right. There, there are smaller websites out there, but they don't really have the catalog and critical mass. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, awesome. And what would you leave the listeners with if they're looking for, um, obviously you've left so many nuggets today, but if they're looking for career advice or financial literacy or whatever yeah. you think is the most important for someone to take away today, obviously you've given us our action step to write yeah. down that we don't care about um, yeah. those out exterior motives, but what, what is it for you? Yeah, I, I, a couple of things. I, I would say that before investing in any stock or before starting any company, please do a detailed write-up first. It'll stop you from making mistakes. It's a safety net as well. And a lot of people start businesses without writing a business plan. And failing to plan is planning to fail. And starting a company, it's one of the most important decisions you'll make in life. You know, if it doesn't work out well, you can lose a lot of money. Uh, you know, your, your social life gets impacted, your health care as well. Uh, you deteriorate. So please, 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 before starting a company, write a business plan first. And as part of my, my MBA degree program, I have a venture capital boot camp uh, as well, based on my work experience, working in venture capital and teaching, et cetera. Now, when it comes to investment write-ups, before you invest in a stock, 
write down why you want to. And I provide you with one page templates that analyze fundamentals, valuation, and technicals, and 150 page templates I have as well if you want to be a very long term <laughs> investor. And by writing down your thoughts on why you want to buy a stock before you buy it, it'll stop you from making dumb mistakes. Also, let's assume that I did an investment write up for a company I wanted to buy today and I bought the stock. And let's fast forward one year into the future. And the stock is going down a lot. Everybody on TV is saying, sell it. Uh, and you're freaking out and you want to sell it because it's on sale, which is moronic. I want you to go back to that one pager and think to yourself this. Okay, the stock is down because of reason X. Had I known about reason X one year ago when I made this one pager, would I have still bought the stock? And if the answer is no, then sell it. If the answer is yes, then buy more. That, that's powerful because most of the time we end up putting ourselves in predicaments where we don't even know what direction we want. We're just scared and we want our money to be safe. And it, it's, a, it's a crazy world out there. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I think your, your comments about the VIX and really understanding why you're jumping into investment is key. Yeah. Absolutely key. Yeah, and, and, and I really do believe in being long-term focused as well. The longer the view, the wiser the intention. Um, it stops you from being a tourist in a stock and just renting them. You know, you got to say to yourself, I don't know the path, but I know the destination, meaning your target price is much, much higher. Don't value companies also based on earnings this year or next year, because everybody does that. Create your own financial models and value companies based on your earnings expectations in five or 10 years. And for me personally, I usually invest in companies if I think they're a five by five. What that means is this, a 500% return within five years. Now, I'm wrong a hell of a lot. But if I'm a little bit right about some of them, then I do well. Be long-term focused always because nobody is. Skate to where the puck is going to be. I love that. And when you say long-term, what do you mean by that? Are we talking five years, 10 years, 20 lifetime. I know Warren Buffett yeah. doesn't, yeah. he doesn't sell. Really. Yeah, yeah Buff, and, and Buffett's interesting. He says, um, when I invest in stocks, I assume the stock market will be closed for 10 years. And obviously, you know, it's not gonna be closed for 10 years, but that's what you gotta think. You gotta think longer term. And I've humbly done very well in growth stocks over the years, like Amazon. And people used to tell me when I worked in the hedge fund industry, why are you buying Amazon 100 times earnings? That's a widow maker. And I would say, no, it's actually trading at two times my earnings estimate. And you'd be like, what? And I would say, it's trading at two times my earnings estimates in 10 years. You got to look out longer term. And when you come up with PE valuation based price targets, it has to be based on your earnings expectations in five or 10 years. And that's something I teach uh, in my MBA program. How do you separate yourself from your environment? Because it sounds like the venture people all had the, just from that little tidbit story right there, that they all had the thought process of, it's not gonna work, it's already too far gone. Like, Because they're thinking venture investing at that moment. Meanwhile, you're thinking completely different from them. Yeah, yeah. It's When you work in venture capital, there are different pressures because you have to deploy capital. You have to invest now. Otherwise you don't get fees, right? And so, it's different. And, and it's tough because you want to chase waves and look for the next trend everyone's looking at. The problem is you have some of the best. And there's a lot of great people that work in BC, right? But there's a lot of sharks too. But a lot of the venture capital partners are great salespeople as well, right? And so there's this element of co-opetition. You compete against them. And then if they beat you, their companies need to raise money again in the future. So they call you. The bottom line, though, is always do your own research. And I don't want anybody to, you know, watch CNBC and, and listen to these, 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 these well-spoken mutual fund managers tell you what to buy and sell. Always do your own research. Never read editorials. Always do your own research and be long-term focused because everybody has a bias. Even these, these bankers that get on television, these analysts, you know, they'll say there's a Chinese wall separating banking from, you know, their trading division. They're biased. They're, they're all biased because they might own a stock or their clients own a certain stock or their company might want to do business with large firms that do M&A so they won't say negative things about companies. 
So you just got to put horse blinders on it. Always do your own research. Don't listen to me or listen to anybody. And I humbly provide my students with lots of tools to teach them how to fish instead of providing them with a fish. Always do your own research because as Steve Jobs said, nobody is smarter than you. Yeah, I love that. And so what do you think about the people who are at their jobs? They're mm -hmm. happy doing that, but they're not that financially literate because we seem like we're kind of diving into yeah. the, um, the financial world. I mean, what, what would you recommend for them? Yeah, if you don't have time to do research, on individual stocks, then rather than buying mutual funds, I recommend buying ETFs, exchange traded funds, because ETFs outperform mutual funds and the fees are way lower as well. And the taxes are lower because the way that government set up uh, trading frameworks globally is the tax code globally is such that if you buy and sell something and make money in a year, you pay higher taxes. If you buy something and you sell it next year, you pay lower capital gains taxes. And so ETFs, they don't buy and sell like mutual funds do. Mutual fund managers chase performance and get a bonus. And so the fees are higher on mutual funds. And when you pay taxes on those mutual funds, when you get your K-1 tax document, whatever it might be, you're going to pay more in taxes, which are kind of like hidden fees. Yeah, because they're trading inside of that portfolio instead of the ETF fees. I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. And um, I know we talked about a couple different financial literacy tips, live below your means, long-term focus. Is there anything else you would include in there? I would say diversification. So there's this old rule, this is antiquated, but you take 100 minus your age, and that's the percentage of your portfolio that should be in growthier or slightly riskier assets. I'll give you an example. If you're 75 years old, 100 minus your age of 75 is 25. So 25% of your investment should be in growth-oriented companies. And 75% should be in lower risk. If you're 25 years old, 100 minus 25 is 75. 75% of your investment should be in slightly riskier or growthy investments. And 25% in value because value investments, because you got the rest of your life to kind of make it back. Also, diversification is crucial. And the best way to think about diversification is take your liquid net worth outside of your house or apartment if you own one. And whatever your liquid net worth is, I don't want you to ever put more than 5% into one stock or investment. Okay, And there's also sector diversification as well. Don't invest only in the tech sector. Don't just buy stocks. You want to have a diversified portfolio of stocks, bonds, commodities, and REITs if you can't buy real estate. It's real estate investment trusts. And I teach this in much more detail in, in my MBA program. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, and there's just not, no one's talking about this stuff. So yeah. Chris, I, uh, I definitely appreciate you going out of your way, creating the MBA, Thank putting you. all the free content on YouTube. It, it really, it's changing people's lives. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And again, when one teaches to learn. Yeah, absolutely. So Chris, is there anything else that you want the audience to know or because um, we're kind of winding it down? Obviously, yeah. we want to check out uh, heronmba.com yeah, for all you. those learnings. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I would, I would say think long term about your career. And so what Jeff Bezos does at Amazon or used to do when he was CEO is he would have all of his product managers write a press release today that's going to come out many years in the future. For example, Amazon Prime, that product manager would write a press release today coming out in the future. Same thing with AWS, Kindle, et cetera. And then what he does is that's kind of a gap analysis. It kind of shows you where are you now and where do you want to be in the future? How do you fill that gap? By the same token, I teach my students and I recommend that you write your resume today that's going to be in 10 years. And I call it your simple, perfect resume. And by doing that, there's a gap and you work on how to achieve those gaps. Goal setting is crucial as well. And so at Yale University in the class of 1950, they asked what percent of you have written down your goals and only 3% had. Then 20 years later in the class of 19, or in, in 1970, they asked those same people that graduated in 1950, what your net worth is. 
And the net worth of the 3% that had written down their goals was greater than the other 97% combined. And so what I recommend, in addition to creating your perfect resume 10 years in the future today, I recommend that everybody write down your goals and put it in a calendar entry on your iPhone or Android handset that repeats daily at, say, 5 a.m. And in brackets, put down your deadline date as well, because most people give up on their New Year's resolutions by the third week of January because they don't set, set deadline dates. Yeah, that put, <laughs> Chris, the thing is that that Yale comment mm -hmm. was so profound to me that I literally put my goals up on the wall. And I, I think I was watching one of your courses where I heard it because that one comment was so drastic. It's such a little thing, but it's knowing the direction you're going in. It might not be in the field you want. It might not be in the whatever you want, but it all kind of ends up in this same area of like, even from your story going into venture capital, now you're teaching venture capital how it works and how these hedge funds work and how all these different operate. Yeah. It's really fascinating stuff and it's knowing the direction you're going in. I completely agree. Yeah, and vocalize your goals too. Like tell your friends or people you can trust outside of work. Because when you vocalize your goals, it, it kind of puts pressure on you. I say with love my heart to get it done. Yeah. Absolutely. Chris, thank you so much for coming on. This has been amazing. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was fun, man. I appreciate it.